<laughs> in this paper, we're definitely descending into these softer ends of uh, softer regions of science, really, uh, and away from sort of um, much more sort of hard sort of DNA stuff. Think about paleoecology, and I want to think about how I want to discuss how we can use uh, paleoecology to think through. Uh, some of the debates about the relationship between past humans and aspects of their environment and their landscapes too. Uh, and I'm going to do the, to do this. I want to discuss some recent work that um, I've been involved in, which is looking at the relationship between uh, patterns of settlement and mobility and the environment during uh, the uh, North European in the North European Mesolithic. Now, something we see a lot of in the Mesolithic in terms of settlements is that particular locations in the landscape are often revisited on numerous occasions, often over very prolonged periods of time, so certainly centuries, sometimes millennia. And these locations are often described as persistent places. Um, and there are two different ways in which generally they've been explained. And these two different ways, I think, also sort of sum up the, I suppose, the broader sort of ways in which, broader schools of thought in which we think about human environment relationships. So one of these takes a very functional and economic approach. It argues that these locations possess particularly rich environmental resources. So there's lots of animals, there's lots of like tasty plants and stuff like that. Um, or they have certain functional characteristics. So their uh, vantage points, access points between one bit of the landscape and another. And it's these economic and functional aspects of, I suppose, the environment and the topography of these sites that um, leads people to revisit them repeatedly. Uh, the second approach is more cultural. It simply suggests, and maybe a bit wishy-washy as well, it simply suggests that it's something about these locations uh, or the history of these sites, of these places, that make them appropriate places to visit in the landscape. And the question is, can we tell which of these two interpretations is, um, is, is right, which is the most appropriate for what we're seeing in the Mesolithic? So to try and resolve this, I've been looking at the relationship between patterns of settlement and the environment around the Paleo Lake Flixton in the Eastern Vale of Pickering in North Yorkshire, the lovely North Yorkshire. Um, and uh, this is a Paleo Lake, so it's not there anymore, but when it was there in the Mesolithic, uh, it was a, a significant focus for human activity throughout much of the period. So each of these dots is a known area of uh, Mesolithic activity. Um, and at many of these sites, we see evidence for repeated episodes of occupation. Uh, and for those where we have decent chronologies, which is um, a, a sadly much smaller number of sites, um, but where we do have decent chronologies, we can see multiple phases of activity, sometimes spanning centuries at a time, which together span much of the Mesolithic. Now, we already know a fair bit about, uh, about the lake environment. We know that it changed significantly during the time this landscape was inhabited. So within the lake, we get a succession of wetland environments that expand into the basin, gradually infilling the basin, and the nature of these environments also varies over time. Peat forming environments begin to encroach over what would have been dry ground around the lake, so burying parts of the Mesolithic landscape during the time Mesolithic people were there, not literally burying people, but you know, it's, it's slower, people run away. Um, and there's also um, uh, and there's also the terrestrial vegetation also changes with early, Hol uh, with early Holocene woodland succession, so the developed change from birch woodland then lots of hazel, and then uh, a more mixed, broadly deciduous forest. So all this environment is changing during the time people lived there. So what I wanted to do was see how these changes relate to patterns of activity and the occupation of particular places. And to do this, um, we recorded a series of plant macrofossil fossil profiles uh, adjacent to some of these recurrently occupied sites. Um, so I hear you ask, what does this show us? Well, um, I'll give you a very brief example from um, the site of Flixton Schoolhouse Farm, which is that one there. Um, this is where we've been doing some work. This is a oh, wrong thing. That won't move that. Um, it's, uh, the site is focused on a small, low-lying hill on the southern shore of the lake. Um, we haven't done, we haven't test-pitted the whole of the, of the top of the hill, um, <coughs> but uh, from the work we've done so far, the main area where we get the, the main area, where in fact, the only real part of the hill where we get any sort of density of material is when we test it in this area, and that's why we've gone back and excavated more of it. There might be activity on other parts of the hill, but we haven't come across anything other than very, very tiny assemblages of, of uh, work flint uh, elsewhere. Um, so we've carried excavations there. Um, this gives us a chronology. Um, so we have uh, multiple dated events, for want of a better word. I'm trying to work out if sevens in the audience tonight, how I might phrase the word in terms of dating, which is not excellent. 
Um, so some of these are stratigraphically uh, distinct, so they could be separate visits to the site. Uh, we have at least one prolonged phase of activity. Um, but it's difficult to tell, we have, we have durations in most of these cases. So all we can really say is the site is visited on multiple, at multiple times throughout much of the Mesolithic. Um, there is some evidence for uh, changes in the forms of activity over this period. So this area here is the bit where we have a sort of uh, a black and prolonged phase of activity that we can see uh, through the dating. Um, and this, uh, so this has uh, sort of digging of pits, some post holes built and stake hole structures, and some of these features are associated with hazelnut uh, roasting. Um, Certainly, the earlier phase of activity, none of its dates, to, none, of, none of that has any contemporary uh, archaeological features. So uh, none of these, uh, so none of these post-built structures relate to that early phase. So maybe we're doing something, something quite different at that time. Um, and certainly, there some of them are too early for them to be uh, collecting hazelnuts because there were no hazel trees. Uh, and then later phase of activity are down here. The features are slightly different in form, so maybe different functions as well. And there also some have dug a, an enormous, like, whopping hollow. And right at the end of the site, um, which again is fun it appears to be functionally very different from everything else. So different forms of activity at the time, during the times this site is occupied. So the environmental record comes from a series of plant map fossil profiles. I just want to put this up because I was great putting uh, some sort of environmental profile up on the slide in tag. But obviously I won't talk through this because that'd be really boring. Um, what I will do is just show you some pictures instead. So what this shows us, what, what this thing here shows us, is how the environment at this site changes during the time people are going there. So when they first visit, um, the site is like right next to open water on both the northern and its eastern sides. Um, it's got this thin fringe of uh, probably reed swamp. There are birch, willow and aspen trees growing at the water's edge. There's probably birch and ferns on certainly around the hill and on parts of the top of the hill too. Um, by the time people are digging pits and post holes and processing hazelnuts, the edge of the lake has um, silted up, so the, the very shallow bits around what would have been the shore were now terrestrialised. You've got willow and aspen are growing on that area. The reed swamp is becoming more extensive and running into the lake. And on the drier ground, you're starting to get more hazel trees. Uh, so the composition of the terrestrial landscape around the edges of the hill are also starting to change. What happens next? Um, by the first of our sort of later visits, the landscape is complete. Well, the site is completely different. So by this point, most of the shallow parts of the lake margins have been infilled. There's a 150 meter stretch of, or over 150 meters of terrestrialized fen. The willow and aspen trees have disappeared. It presumably gets too wet for them. Um, so composition of the of the sort of lake edge and wetlands vegetation is also changing. Ah. Okay, so it's just basically just really different. And by the time the latter phase of activity of the site is taking place, um, there is just um, uh, alder car all around the site, and the lake itself has completely, the whole lo the local setting has completely changed. Um, very, very quickly, because I've definitely run out of time now, the, we can also see that the landscape itself changes massively during the time that this and other sites around the lake are occupied, with this eventual infilling of the basin with these wetland environments. Being, oh, I should have said also at Fixed Grass Farm from 7000 BC, the dryland parts of the site are starting to be buried under peat as well. So the site goes from being a hill to an island, basically cut off from the surrounding area. And that happens in numerous other locations around the lake. And try as I may, I can't find the next slide that shows the basis of the final infilling, which is sad really. Well, it's a sorry state of affairs because normally at Tag I'll be able to say, oh, I've left this in my office. Well, my office is over there. So, right, and, and I've looked. But anyway, you get the impression it all in fields. And this has a massive effect on, um, not just on, on the environment, or on or like the, the plants that are there, but also the behaviours of animals and uh, the rich species around, how they're going to behave. And that has itself has a massive knock on effect on the um, economic practices that are taking place at these sites. And despite this, um, numerous locations around the lake are occupied throughout this period. And I just, I would suggest. That, that means that um, the decisions, the, the rationale behind the decisions people make about when, about where to visit and where to carry out sort of economic activities isn't solely dictated by the nature of the local environment, by particular resources, and it would be other, some sort of other cultural factors that are behind that. And obviously, because I've run out of time, which is marvellous, I don't have to say what those cultural factors might have been. <laughs> but just one last final point. If the decisions people make to visit sites are culturally informed, Perhaps the way in which they move around their landscape might also be structured by cultural concerns. 
like maybe you know think about some uh, ethnographic analogy like uh, uh the direction that people move might be structured culturally as well. The root ways people are taken around the landscape might be prescribed in some other way. And I just think that once you start using the, the paleoecological paleo data to think this way, this isn't to say that people don't go to places because there are resources, but they do. Um, but when you start thinking in this way, um, then I think you just get you can start to then think about what those things are, what those cultural rules might be, and so forth. And that's it. And this is just a. a, 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 a picture of happy, though in my case miserable people, on a very cold November coring and excavation period. So thank you very much. Thank you to you guys for organising this. And sorry for running over.